Hi, this is Mike Crow, and I run a home inspection business. In fact, I've run a couple of home inspection businesses. The true joy for me, though, has been helping literally thousands of home inspectors build really solid home inspection businesses as well. We can help a single man operation be able to do over $300,000 a year, maybe all the way up to $400,000 a year as a single inspector operation. Even better for me is the 80 plus companies that we have helped be able to build million dollar home inspection businesses. I would like to help you be able to do the same thing. We're back with more of Mike's teaching on Atomic Habits from our recent Mastermind event. If you would like to learn more about our Mastermind coaching program, go to MikeCrowReturns.com. I am at the beginning of chapter three, which is page 44, all right? And it's four simple steps, four simple steps uh, to changing your life. Now, I'm not going through the whole book. I'm just going to hit a few more highlights here. I'm going to tell you some of the secrets that I've been using, and I'm going to tell you my latest, greatest secret that I've just <coughs> changed, I just made, and honestly, it's because of this book here uh, that I've done to try to help myself uh, in, in, in one thing. So uh, they did this trial. It thought it was kind of funny. They took the, took the cats, and they put them in a box, and they put a lever in there, uh, and uh, what happened was when the cats pushed the lever the right direction or, or, or stepped on it or whatever it was, then the cats got out. And the cats want it out. You ever had a cat? You know they, they want it out. Okay? Uh, and so they'd poke their nose in the corner, stick their paws through the openings, claw at loose objects, and after a few minutes of expiration, the cats would eventually press the magical lever and the door would open and they would escape. Okay? So he tried this hap several times and, um, and, and the, been pressed the door open and the process learning began. All right? This is where I started marking my thing right here at the beginning of this chapter right here, which is I thought was incredible. After 20 to 30 trials, think about that. After about 20 to 30 trials, this behavior became so automatic and habitual, the cat could escape within a few seconds. Okay? For example, he noted that cat number 12 took the following times to perform the act. 160 seconds the first time. 30 seconds the second time. 90 seconds the third time, right? And then 60, 15, 28, 20, 30, 22, 11, 12, 20, 12, 10, 10, 14, 8, 8, 5, 10, 8, 6, 6, and 7 seconds to perform the act. What I want you to understand is that so many times people say, well, I tried that. Okay? Have you tried it 20 times? And so from his studies, describe the learning process. Behaviors, this is important, behaviors following or followed by satisfying consequences tend to be repeated. And those that produce unpleasant consequences are less likely to be repeated. After you stumble, and this is, I think this is an interesting choice of words, after you stumble on an ex unexpected reward, you alter your strategy for the next time. Your brain immediately begins to catalog the events that preceded the reward. So wait a minute, that felt good. What did I do right before that? Now I will tell you that I'm going through something right now even that's on the bad side of this, right? I have, over the last six months, I've been having a series of headaches, which I can't explain. And so I asked myself, all right, so what did I do? What did I eat that day? At one point, beer, uh, at one point, I, I went, you know, it broke my heart. I had a beer, and that night I had a headache. Beer created the headache, you know? But then a week later, I had another beer, and no headache at all. Going, oh, okay, good, it's not the beer, okay? <laughs> but, but it can be also negative, you know, what caused that, you know? Uh, what... What caused the good feeling? What caused the bad feeling that you have to go through inside of that? Habits are really simply reliable solutions to reoccurring problems in our environment. And so as habits are created, the level of activity in the brain decreases. Do you think the cat had to think as long about doing that? No. I mean, boom, it's done. Six seconds, six seconds, seven seconds, it was done. Okay? And, and if the test went on, it might even get shorter than that. Here's the other coolest thing about, here's the other coolest thing about habits. Have you ever watched anybody think and think and think and think and think and think about making a decision? That's a lot of thinking. If you develop the right kind of habits, it frees up your thinking power. I want to say that again. If you do the right kind of habits, develop the right kind of habits, it gives you more brain power, gives you more thinking ability. 
And the question are, are you intentionally developing habits so that you'll have more brain power? Most people do not realize when they get up in the morning, and I think you said this, maybe, maybe I read it somewhere else, but they don't realize they get up in the morning, they put their shoes on, they almost always put the same shoe on first. Almost always. They don't even think about it, right? They almost always, not always, but they almost always sit in the same spot when they put their shoes on, okay? So what kind of systems are you putting in place? Because if you don't have to think about putting your shoes on, it frees up brain space, and you can be actually thinking about other things while that's doing it. So I thought that was pretty cool. So one of the things on page 47 was this really good, simple little graph. There's a four-step process to, you know, building habits, okay? Uh, four simple steps. The first one is a cue, something that triggers Something that triggers the habit. Second one is a craving. Whoa, that was good. I want more of that. Uh, third is a response. And the fourth is a reward. Okay? So first there's a clue. The clue triggers the brain to initiate a behavior. So it's a small piece of information that predicts. Notice it jumps all the way to the end. Predicts a reward. Okay? So cravings are the second step. And they're the motivational force behind every habit. You start craving certain things. You ever crave something? Okay? I have craved hamburgers sometimes. I have craved chocolate sometimes. I have craved the desire to go see a movie sometimes. Okay? The third step is response. The third step is response. If a particular action requires more physical or mental effort than you're willing to expend, then you won't do it. So uh, you want to make sure that that's not the case, especially when you're starting it, and you have to teach your brain over that. And then finally, the response delivers a reward. So here's the thing about rewards. The first purpose, the first purpose of rewards is to satisfy your craving, is to satisfy your craving. The second, rewards teach us which actions are worth remembering in the future. Your brain is a reward detector. Your brain is a reward detector. That's on page 49. And then the last paragraph down here that I highlighted, if a behavior is insufficient in any of these four targets or stages, it will not become a habit. It simply won't. So eliminate the clue, okay, or the cue, and it won't happen. Your habit will never start. Reduce the craving, and you won't experience uh, enough emotion or motivation to act. Make the behavior difficult, and you won't be able to do it. And if the reward fails to satisfy your desire, you got no reason to do it again. So he built this little graph here, and I want you to see the way I did this, because I added this to it. It all starts with the cue, right? And then it goes to craving, then it goes to response, and then it comes back to reward, kind of stops there. Now at this point, your body is looking for, wow, that was kind of cool. Your body is now looking for that cue again. You understand? Your brain is a cue or a reward detector. So if you did something, you, got, you felt really good about that, now you're going, huh, how do I do that again? That's the most important part of building successful habits. Uh, in summary, the cue triggers a craving, which motivates a response, which provides a reward, which satisfies the craving, and ultimately per, uh, becomes associated with the, the cue, okay? And then he's got four law, uh, laws of uh, behavior here and everything, and the, this is really important. Uh, page 54 at the bottom, there are four parts here. Your brain needs to see the cue. It may not even be really conscious to you. It would be better if it was conscious to you. So the bottom four here are the, the steps. How can I make it obvious? How can I make it obvious that there's a cue? I'm going to tell you here in a second how you can make it obvious in some cases more. One of the things I do, of course, is I put up signs everywhere, all around me in different ways. So I want to be a family man. My closet, and I learned this from a book, uh, my closet is my trophy, my my kid trophy place. So I have pictures of me coaching my kids in my closet. I have pictures of different things I've done with my kids, maybe go to an amusement park. I have uh, ribbons hanging from things that I did with my kids, okay? So uh, I make it obvious. And then how can I make it attractive? And then the, the third really is how can I make it easy? This one a little tougher than it sounds because the world does not want to make it easy for you to do the right habits. The world, in fact, wants you to do the wrong habits. They want you to eat wrong. Sugar is a, an addictive substance, and I am addicted to sugar, okay? I, I just admit it, all right? Uh, maybe it's better than being addicted to, uh, you know, other white stuff, 
all right? But I'm not sure it's any different in the long run, all right? And then number four, how can I make it satisfying? Uh, and so he talks in here about, you know, a habit is a behavior that has been repeated enough times to become automatic. The ultimate purpose of habits is to solve the problems of life with as little energy and effort as possible. This is at the bottom of page 55. It's the chapter summary. Any habit can be broken down into the feedback loop. Any habit can be broken down into the feedback loop that involves cue, uh, cue craving, response, and reward. And then the four laws of habits make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, and make it satisfying. And then he starts jumping into the, uh, the habits. Um, the human brain is a prediction machine. Page 60 is beginning one chapter there. Um, and uh, a lot of times you don't realize that your habits become such habits. Thank you. Um, and uh, I find it interesting pulling people out of one environment and putting them into another environment. We hired a young lady once that had obviously worked with children a lot. And she had gotten used to say, listen, listen. And we couldn't break her of the habit. And we finally had to let her go. Listen, are you listening to me? Listen. And I mean, she, over and over again, she would say that throughout the day. Because that's what she was used to saying to, you know, elementary children or, or young people. So it's kind of interesting because a former preschool teacher, uh, her old habits would kick in and she would ask coworkers, so did you wash your hands? <laughs> I mean, but you know, that, there's a story. And there was a gentleman who had spent years working as a lifeguard, and he would see a kid running and go, uh, walk. You know? I mean, but you have to understand, they're not necessarily bad habits, but they're inappropriate in the setting that they're in. And so you find that people have a hard time changing their habits from one. Until you make the unconscious conscious, this is one of the biggest things I do. I make the unconscious conscious. Okay, it's the last sentence on the paragraph before it says the habit scorecard here. It will direct your life and you will call it fate. Now, I will tell you that at the beginning of that whole last chapter, one of the things that it says was you will see things and you don't know why you're doing it. You just know it's the right thing to do. Okay, there was a lady that uh, her father-in-law walked in. She goes, man, we are going to the hospital right now. He goes, why? I feel perfectly fine. Okay, turned out he had... Uh, his coloring just wasn't right. She picked up on it. He was in surgery immediately. Probably would have died if she hadn't done that. Okay? There are people in the military. Who's in the military here have been in the military? Okay? All right? There are situations in the military where soldiers are at such a point where uh, on a radar screen, they can tell the difference between a blip that is a missile coming at them and a blip that looks exactly the same to the human eye that is an aircraft. Okay? It looks the same. But even recently, uh, and he talks about it in here, even recently, uh, there was somebody that actually said, uh, that's a missile, shoot that puppy down. And everybody went, it could be an airplane. He insisted, shoot it down. Save the whole ship, okay? And sometimes you don't know why you know something. But making the unconscious conscious, the most you, better you can do with that, the better. So I love this next one at the middle of this page right here. And this is page 63 right here. I saw this at Disney, and I saw it when Susan and I were in Tokyo. This is very important. This is about training your people and doing different things. And um, I, I love the example that uh, Mike and Todd did with their software. They're literally pointing and cueing and calling, as they call it here. The process known as pointing and calling is a safety system designed to reduce mistakes. It seems silly, but it works incredibly well. Pointing and calling reduces errors up to 85% and cuts accidents by 30%. So when we were in Tokyo, okay, there were people in the platform watching the trains as people got on and off and everything else, and, and somebody flags and points and calls and tells the, uh, the, the, the train it's okay to leave, right? And here it talks about in the very bottom, down here at the bottom, um, in the fine text, uh, a reference. Uh, it talks about how one lady, her kid had gotten on, she did not get on, but her arm was stuck in the door, and by the way, in America, our doors hit something, they open back up. This is not the way it is in other countries. That door closed and it stayed closed and her arm was stuck in there and the train was getting ready to take off. Okay? But the person on the platform saw it and he, and he flagged the, the, the driver down and the train did not take off. Literally saved her life. All right? We see this at Disney all the time, right, Susan? We're getting on a ride, and there's, there's three people in some cases, depending on the ride, that are all standing there, and they check the cars, and they check this, and they check that, and one gives thumbs up, 
then the other one gives thumbs up, then the other one gives thumbs up, right? And then the ride goes. That's called pointing and calling. And the question is, in your business, you may not be like a train, you may not be like an amusement ride, but what do you need to point and call out so that you will hit certain things? And by the way, pointing and calling is something that you can do for yourself.